Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cybersecurity criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Laura Chavez. Hello and welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast. This is your co-host, Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Laro Chavez. A lot of interesting things happening in the world. Won't go too in-depth into that right now, but needless to say, it's a new year. I think we have a lot to look forward to. I'm optimistic about it. I know there's a lot of craziness, especially in politics right now, but there's a lot of good things happening as well, most of which the media doesn't cover. But with that said... Why don't we hand it over to Mike Rotondo for the news. Good day and welcome to 2021. Here's the headlines. Some bad news for Zyxel. Secret backdoor discovered in Zyxel firewalls and AP controllers. And then the companion story, hackers start exploiting the new backdoor in Zyxel devices. Apparently there was a hard-coded credential in there that was used for FTP um, that hackers are using to exploit Zyxel firewalls. So if you got one, patch it. Gen X pharmacy ransomware attack resulted in a data breach. Gen X, and I'm sure we've all seen those commercials, or Gen RX, I should say. We've all seen those commercials. They've been hacked. Some patient data was stolen, but they were able to fend it off pretty quickly. Hey, remember Ticketmaster? Guess what they did? They hacked a rival business, hired an employee from another business, and then used him to go ahead and hack into that former business. So that's all cool. Um, They did get a $10 million fine for it. PayPal users targeted a new SMS phishing campaign. So if you're using PayPal and you get an SMS, uh, be careful. Malware is using the Wi-Fi BSSID for victim identification. They're using this to geolocate you and give you an idea, give them an idea of where you're actually at and then uh, tailoring malware for you. I didn't want to do a whole lot of solar winds, but there are two pieces of solar winds I wanted to talk about today. Solar winds hit with a class action lawsuit following Orion breach. I think it's fair to say that SolarWinds is going to be suited to oblivion um, at some point here, and that's uh, too bad. FBI, CISA, ODNI, and NSA blame Russia for the SolarWinds hack. Uh, That's going to happen as well. Um, So there'll be more investigations into that, hopefully. Major gaming companies hit with ransomware linked to APT27. APT27 is a Chinese uh, APT, and uh, apparently they like playing video games. Most public sector victims refuse to pay ma- ransomware games, which is actually really good news. They found 86% of public sector respondents targeted with ransomware refuse to pay, um, which, Excellent. yeah, which is great news. Uh, unfortunately, non-public companies are paying at, at a much higher rate, almost 69%. So, and lastly, IoT Cybersecurity Act successfully signed into law. Uh, this is going to help the federal government from deal with vulnerable IOT devices uh, as they go forward. So that's the headlines for today. And uh, Laura, got anything you want to add? Well, <laughs> that's right. welcome to 2021, right? So as we go, as we, as we start from the bottom moving upward, not a lot of major vulnerabilities to be patching for this last week. Um, just a lot of Gen 2, Linux, Oracle is still having some issues. So if you're running local, check that. If you're running Gen 2 Linux, check that. If, if Also, if you're running WordPress, there's a new shell upload that's just been published as a working exploit. I think it'd probably be, it's probably good to go ahead and make sure that you don't have the WP Discuss plugin running. And that's that's the plugin to do discussion board type stuff. Um, the version 7.04 is vulnerable and, and previous is vulnerable to this to the shell upload. Uh, which is um, pretty serious, and then you're going to get your uh, you're going to get the rest of the server compromised uh, just by that one WordPress shell upload. So if you got WordPress, make sure you're looking at that. And uh, that's that's about it. I hope everybody had a great holiday season. And what are we talking about today, Zach? Take it back. Today we have one of my favorite topics, which is implementation models around cybersecurity. And so let me back up a little bit and talk about why that matters. We get a lot of companies. They will reach out, especially business to business technology companies, software as a service, system integrators, companies like that. They're emerging and mid market companies are growing. Things are going well. They're getting new clients, have good revenue coming in. And then all of a sudden, boom, they hit this 
cybersecurity growth ceiling, I call it. And what that is, is when eventually they start to get to the point where they're trying to land more and more large enterprise contracts. They're going after the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, and they got a big fish on the line. Their, their salespeople are all spun up and, and excited, ready to go. And there's this million dollar contract sitting out there. And then comes the cybersecurity questionnaire from that prospect, right? It's something that they're not prepared to answer. Could be 100, 150 detailed questions about their cybersecurity practice. And it's at that point they realize, wait, we've never actually formalized a cybersecurity program. I mean, yeah, we have firewalls and we do some patching here and there and that sort of thing, but we don't actually have a formal program in place. So what do we do now? And so they come to us start to ask or, or other, certainly other, other companies all over the country, right? Cybersecurity service providers, and they try to figure this out, right? The first thing is that they're kind of in this infinite sea of options, right? The, there's a lot of hype in the cybersecurity industry right now. There's a lot of, there are a lot of people selling snake oil and there's a lot of good stuff too, but for the people that don't have a background in it, how do they weed through this kind of mess of stuff that's available out there? So today we'll talk about the different models. When it comes to building a cybersecurity program, what are your real options, right? The first obvious one, the place where a lot of organizations, especially the, the small organizations start, is the DIY model, right? The do it yourself. Uh, there are a lot of more, there are a lot of platforms and things coming up that are making this a little bit more realistic for companies. And, and some companies, that's their only choice, right? If you have three or five people in an office and you need to need to get there and build build something a lot of times you got to get down and just do it yourself may not have the the money and resources to know how to find the right people to, to bring in and do it so a lot of a lot of people go after the do it yourself approach and there there's certainly pros to that right you could save you potentially save money but the problem is what's your time worth right if you're building a security program uh, what what's your time worth but a lot of times it's better to do this and start here then just do nothing, all right? So a lot of people end up doing a little bit uh, up front, the uh, do-it-yourself model, and then eventually bring somebody in because it does take your, your team's approach from, from the, their core business activities into trying to figure out cybersecurity, which is probably not their, their issue. So I wanted to cover that part first, just get that out of the way. The do-it-yourself model, I think is pretty obvious, but the next comes into the hiring in-house security professionals. And I know Mike and Laurie, you both wrote a lot and spoke a lot about bringing people in-house, um, certainly beneficial. And I think every company should try, but what are your thoughts? What are the, the struggles companies are, are running into when it comes to that approach? But if they're going to bring people in-house, how should they go about doing that? Well, the number one challenge with that is simply scarcity of resources. I mean, Finding a cybersecurity resource that would be willing to come into a small shop full time is going to be minimal because, and the other thing is, are you going to be able to find someone uh, who is senior or who knows the strategy, but is also willing to most likely in a small shop have to shoulder the burden, be it assist with the network, assist with the servers, assist with, you know, do the end work that they, they're gonna to need to augment. And most small companies aren't gonna be able to do that. So scarcity and then, you know, finding the, that actual resource and finding someone with an actual skill set that will satisfy that. But when you do find that person, I mean, they can be great, they have to be supported, but they have to be paid as well. And that's the other challenge that small businesses find. I mean, we see that all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, I think there's nothing, nothing can truly replace having somebody in house, but chances are most companies aren't going to be that jack, be able to find the jack of all trades, the, the kind of savant genius that can do everything. Uh, yeah, no, I completely agree with what, what Mike's saying. And, you know, the other challenge is, you know, knowing your environment. And so in the case of the small business, it's like, you know, you've got budget for one person, you know, are you going to be able to get like, like what, you know, Mike and Zach are talking about one individual that's going to be able to to juggle all of the cybersecurity tasks and actually want to do it when they know most of the time 
he or she will know that they can go to a large organization and play as a member of a larger team and then not have to shoulder such a burden, right? And a more organized organization that may be more of attractive to them than maybe making, you know, 10 or 15 grand more, having to shoulder the majority of the work at a small organization because they just don't, they don't have the support. And then that may be a question, you know, also for, for the security professionals out there, you know, is that something you want to do? Because there's certainly a lot of organizations out there that could benefit from a jack of all trades that, you know, wants to come in and, and manage that program. And the organization is, you know, the size that's adequate and with the technology that is simplistic enough, yet mature enough to warrant defense in depth and be able to to sustain a model and such with, with one human or two humans in, involved in the majority of the cybersecurity work. It's certainly possible, especially with the tools and technologies we have today. But the, the mindset from the individual has got to be right. And, and that's got to be something they really want to do because um, some organizations don't realize the amount of work and the amount of burden that it's going to take, especially if you're not going to support the individual. They're going to realize that. It's, it's a more common and talked about topic, I think, these days that cybersecurity professionals don't sometimes get the support from leadership internal that they need, uh, especially to be successful at their job. So they, they'll they understand that's a fact and they may ask you in the interview process, like, do we do we have a budget dedicated for this? And, you know, I expect to get extra help in a certain amount of time. I'm going to be able to hire a team in the next year. What is the vision of cybersecurity if the question doesn't get answered or you might not know that? Uh, you may lose a talented individual because they realize they may be getting um, you know, set up to kind of walk off into the off the end of the dock, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Another consideration for this particular model of bringing in, an in-house security professional or or multiple security professionals. First, I, I would certainly encourage it. Right, nothing nothing beats the human element, boots on the ground. Right. So that's with that said, it's not always the right option for for every organization. But organizations that are a little bit larger, more sophisticated, maybe have a maybe have an IT team of of seven to 12, 15 people, they might not have a security professional in the house. Well, in the interim, at least chances are one of those IT professionals may be, have been maybe a, uh, some background in security or has been studying security or wants to make that transition. So that may be, that may be another approach. And we've, we've certainly seen that done in, uh, with client organizations that we serve successfully. And that way you already have somebody that, that has experience with the organization, but now you get to Kind of pull them off and and start uh, allowing them to work on building the security practice. Now, just keep in mind the main thing with that: if you go with that approach, you're still going to need outside help. So, when it comes, if you're thinking about budgeting and that sort of thing, you're still going to need people to come in and do the third-party risk assessments and penetration testing evaluations. They're going to need to fill in the gaps where that particular professional that maybe you pulled from the IT team um, or maybe a newer security professional that you hired. Uh, can't handle uh, internally. They they just they just can't do. They they don't not necessarily the, just because they don't have have the skill set or tools, but but also some of those things you you need to have a third party do to make it really valid and hold weight, like penetration testing, audits, that sort of thing. So when you're when you're thinking about budget, if you're going to br- do the in house approach, just keep in mind that there there's going to be an additional uh, side needed to that, and and more than just hiring the person. Which brings us to the next, kind of the next model that people follow, right? Which is that that managed service provider or managed security service provider. So MSSP or MSP approach that people that people take. And so they're like anything, pros and cons. MSPs can be tremendously valuable for a lot of organizations and offload a lot of the burdens. But I would go ahead and say that. It's not necessarily a full solution most of the time, at least from what we've seen in the marketplace. Have you guys seen anything or have any examples you want to share? If not, I'll dive right into kind of some of the pros and cons that I, I know right off the bat when it comes to MSPs. So one of the downsides, right, we'll start, I guess we'll start with that, is that when you have a, a truly a, a third party, an MSP or MSSP, generally the you, you have to look at the business model, right? And what what is that? What does their, their business model look like? Well, more often than not, and there, there are certainly exceptions out there, there's good ones and bad ones, just like every in every industry and every business, but 
generally, as a rule of thumb, most MSPs and MSSPs are focused on reselling products and tools. And the services side is more of a management of the outputs of those from a remote SOC or something like that from their, their office location with, the, with their team, right? So when you, when you look at that and what the tools really consist of, it's not so much the it's not so much a holistic security program, right? It's great to have tools and, and technologies, but they're certainly not everything. You still need the human element. Somebody still needs to go through and actually build out the security program, formalize it with all the corporate governance and, and whatnot to make it actually hold, right? Because tools and technologies are not, we, I won't beat a dead horse because we've talked about that a lot on previous episodes. Um, but the, uh, one of the pros of course, is that they have a lot more uh, resources available that um, they're using on a on a wide scale across multiple clients. So generally, you can get in and you can get something uh, done a little bit more in a more cost effective manner than you can with trying to build out those capabilities on your own. So I think there's a good blend there as far as MSSPs or MSPs with in-house or other out, outside third parties, right? It's not kind of one or the other. I, I, would, I would think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that's really gonna just do all the cybersecurity for you. It just doesn't work that way. Nah, normally not. And also the thing to consider when you're using MSSP services like Security Operations Center or SIM as they're calling it these days, right? Even in incident monitoring and management. You've got to ensure that that business model as Zach was talking about is sound because you're gonna be sending all of your logs and kind of sensitive information about your technologies to that organization in order for them to triage that data. Like they have to know a lot about you. And you also have to understand how is that data being stored on their end? Um, is it, you know, obviously gonna probably gonna be a multi-tenant environment. How do we ensure that that organization doesn't get breached because it could give a lot of information uh, to an attacker. So it's just one of those risks you have to throw in um, when you're looking at um, outsourcing some of the services, what specific services mean the most to you um, and what specific services also present risk um, as well as reward uh, because there, there is a lot of reward to that event and incident management response. Uh, but it doesn't come free. There is a, a level of risk that you have to accept in order to to have a mature service in that particular aspect. When you're looking at risk, too, a lot of a lot of the to kind of move into the next approach that people. Well, take, let me comment real quick. Like, Just keep in mind that um, you can never wholly transfer risk. Right, you have to continue to accept risk regardless of whether you transfer a third party's managing or not, you still own that risk to a certain extent, maybe a lesser degree, but you still own the risk. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you made the decision to outsource, right? You made the right. decision. You know, to I, and hands. I can't tell you how many times we, we deal with people that are like, oh, it's in the cloud. It's fine. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, <laughs> cloud's great. Security in the cloud can be great, but that doesn't mean that you've offloaded all of your risk and all your concerns to the cloud. You still have your own piece that you own. I, I hope that paradigm of thinking is starting to sunset. But yeah, you're yeah, initially that was the every every leader in the in, in the world thought that that was the acceptable move was to transfer risk to the cloud, move yeah. technology to the yeah. cloud. They're, they're, they they don't seem to think that their their customers gave their that company their data. They don't care if that company's cloud service got breached or not. Their data is still exposed. They're going to blame you know, who they trusted with their data. So right. that's going to be, that's well, what it's all going to come down. Cloud is just somebody else's computer. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, well, another option, of course, is the virtual CISO or CISO as a service goes by different names. And that's become very common in the industry. You see a lot of people that are, are security professionals from, you know, maybe, maybe they're retired or maybe they've started their own consulting practice and they do the virtual CISO approach, which I think can be a good thing for a, a lot of companies. And uh, it's important though, to understand the limitations, right? Because again, as we talk through each of these, we want people to understand that there are, there's 
there's not necessarily a right answer. It depends on the company, but there are limitations to each so that when you're thinking about this, think about it from a more holistic perspective, right? And understand where one organization or one company, one vendor cuts off and you have to fill in a gap with another, right? So virtual CISO is great. They're going to come in, give you time and support to mostly around strategy for the, the organization, figuring out a framework and that sort of thing to get aligned to. They might do some some high level gap analysis against those frameworks, maybe uh, compliance work to help you get aligned with compliance, maybe even some, some of the, uh, the corporate governance side of it. But where the, where the limitation, what most companies run into is that they're, they're uh, most of your, your VC so type services are going to be structured in a way that is uh, set up to basically tell you what needs to happen and then you need to make it happen. Right, so a lot of the hands-on technical work and uh, the, the support that a lot of mid-market organizations need that they don't necessarily have resources for in-house are, are a lot of times not covered for a virtual, by a virtual CISO by themselves. Now, a VCSO should have different vendors right, for, for these different areas to, to cover down on what they can't do themselves. But again, back to budgeting, back to planning, take that into consideration when you're out there you're looking at different organizations to work with different services and such make sure that you're you're looking at it holistically not just hey they're going to charge me this much and everything's going to be good across the board right make sure they're they're filling in the gaps and telling you what they're not going to cover what else you're you're going to likely need in order to have a a security program any other comments on vc so well, yeah, I mean, the other, you know, all good stuff, Zach. And, you know, I think the other thing to mention is that they, they're not empowered to make change. Um, you know, I can't stress that enough. Um, you know, they, they're going to, you know, if they, if they conduct a gap assessment and they create a roadmap and they've got a list of action items that need to be conducted in order to close those gaps and maintain a more compliant state with the framework, they can't, they can't conduct those activities. Those activities may include something that, you need a technology for, right? Like centralized logging or vulnerability scanning. Um, they can't just set up a scanner in their garage and scan you, right? It's gonna to have to be a service you purchase. So there's going to be certain, or stand up yourself, right? There, there's gonna be certain activities that are gonna be coming out of that report that the VC so is gonna say, okay, here's your list of action items. Let me know when you've got some stuff done. Really yeah, remember too that VC so doesn't mean be security engineer button seat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, V V for everybody out there wondering it's v virtual. <laughs> so I mean it's very important to make sure that that's defined and, and, and not the expectation that well because a VC so he's here sitting with me. Yeah, yeah. So but no, I mean, it's also, it's not a CISO. It's not a security engineer. He's not going to be, he's not going to be monitoring things for you. He's not going to be, you know, it, 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 that all can be negotiated, but the expectation has to be set properly with whoever you choose as a vendor. So I need my VCSO and VCSO in the corner office monitoring logs. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and that, but, but we've seen that, right? I mean, the expectation is, oh, well, it's, you know, you've recommended these architectural changes, you're going to go ahead and implement them, right? And it's like, no, we, that's not what we do, you know, so. But it's well, great, so you're the VC, so now, so we'll see you uh, five days a week for lunch? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> exactly. On Zoom. The final model I'll talk about, maybe maybe some others will come to mind, but really the, the, the primary one is really a, a combination of both. Now, this this, I'll talk about it from a lens a little bit larger, more sophisticated organizations that maybe have a couple, a couple security people in house, maybe they're, they're new security professionals and they're handling some of the fundamental activities. But again, the, the, it, the, the organization still lacks a formalized cybersecurity program. We call this a partnered security service provider model or PSSP. That's kind of our own term that we coined, but there are different ways to go about doing it. There's other, some organizations offer staff augmentation, different levels of support. Um, needless to say, it's basically a combination to, of having your uh, in-house professionals uh, at, at a minimum an IT team, but, but maybe a few security professionals and then having a third party come in either remote or, or even maybe on site on occasion to help build out 
the program, mature the program and really make sure that you have that going. Uh, that is, it, it's important to, to realize it's not the same as like, it's not truly the same as staff augmentation and that these people are maybe in and out even if they're in site or in uh, on site at all. But it, it can certainly help to augment bits and pieces with, with people. Again, I think the, the common element here is, is the human element, right? It's not about plugging more technologies in, buying more stuff. It's about putting those resources toward the right people with the right expertise to, to cover your security posture. Another, another thing that we'll touch on briefly today is the age-old question of, oh, well, we have an IT company. Can't they just do our cybersecurity? Right. So I don't know if you guys want to comment on that as well, but uh, it's, it's very, very prevalent, especially in the uh, small business world, which in many small business cases that, um, yes, a lot of times their IT companies will handle some, some level of cybersecurity, whether they build a formalized program or not. Um, I'd say that's more the exception rather than the rule. Um, but that can be a, a option for small business. Now, as soon as they start to get into kind of mid-market emerging, a little bit more sophisticated organizations, and that they need to answer, well, going back to the earlier point about these sophisticated cybersecurity questionnaires coming down and requirements like SOC 2 audits and such, generally your, your IT company is not going to do that. You're going to need to have specialists to make that happen. Totally. The, I mean, you know, to the answer that question, right, <clears throat> I think... We said it earlier on, everybody's part of cybersecurity, right? Everybody at the company's part of cybersecurity. So if you, if you don't have a cybersecurity uh, leader in your organization and you may have a very smart person or working in network or in, you know, software engineering, or, you know, even in, even in, you know, the server workstation area that, that really just has a knack for the stuff, promote them or promote yourself. Uh, you know, take leadership because again, doing something's better than doing nothing. If you know what needs to be done and no one else is doing it, just take responsibility and do it. Um, again, it's everybody's job, right? Everybody's going to play a role in the organization. The organization simply just needs a leader set. Now that's not going to tell you you're going to get money for anything, but documents are free, right? Creating process is free. Creating an organized method of understanding what risks are there. That's all free. That's stuff that you can just do. Um, so if you're one of those individuals um, that, has that capability, then I encourage you, and I think we all would encourage you to, you know, stand up in the organization and, and go forth and create and fight the good fight. Now, for reaching into the organization for somebody to lead or telling IT to, to conduct those types of services, IT needs to, A, either go back to what I first said and identify an individual that's strong in that area set, or again, th I think that's why the, the, the PSSP model was kind of coined by us is because I think that that partnership of expertise coaching um, creates a paradigm in the organization where you don't have a con you don't have a firm that just comes in and does a job and leaves you have a firm that comes in and instills some form of practice and procedures and training for the individuals to then carry on that long after the organization is is the third party is now gone and, and working with their the organizations there's valuable data and, and roles and process that are left behind for the organization to still live off of if you will right that mentality of teaching teaching someone um, the fishing act as opposed to just handing out the fish i think the main thing too for organizations that are looking for outside help the main thing to your point laro is your service provider should never function in a bubble. And unfortunately, that's, that's too common in our industry. Your service provider should be like an extension of your organization, almost like part of your team. Yeah, they may not be. Transparent, yes. But yeah, it it's, goes, goes to that, that train the trainer model, right? They should be empowering your organization internally to uh, get better and better at building out those, that those defense in depth measures, right? At every level of the organization, they should be working with your executive team, talking with the board. They should be educating them on areas that they don't know why cybersecurity is important, what the real risks are to the company. And at the technical level too, helping people understand, okay, why do we do this? Why do we look at security the way we do? Why is this important, right? So that 
everybody has buy-in and that's going to be a good service provider for you. If they say, okay, yeah, we're just going to take care of this. We'll call you next month. That's probably not the right approach. Well, and then going back to what you were saying, it's important to, to educate people on why cybersecurity is important. The old adage of, well, I don't have anything anybody would want to steal or, you know, those kind of things that we still run across. Yeah, we're Not too small. Handy. Yeah, we're too small. We don't have anybody would want to steal. We're, you know what, we're just one location. How are they going to find us? Blah, 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 blah. What they don't understand is that, you know, you have people out there, just like that Zeichsel article, they're just scanning. They're just looking for the SSH, and then they're trying to brute force it. Or they're, they're looking for a specific vulnerability. It's spray and pray. And that's how they're finding victims. And if you're out there and you're on the Internet, I mean, that's why it's so important to educate and have someone who's dedicated to cybersecurity or at least cybersecurity aware inside your organization and then augmented by someone who does know cybersecurity uh, just to ensure the safety. I told my neighbor, I told my neighbor the other day that they need to treat all their technologies connected to the internet of everything. As if you look out your door once a day and you know that the robber is going to walk down the street to see who's home and who's not. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Good point. Well said. Well, a quick recap, there's really, there's no right answer for every organization, right? We talked about some of the pros and cons of the different models and the different ways people go about building a cybersecurity program. Fact of the matter is it takes people to do it and it takes time and resources. Unfortunately, there's no, there's no way around that, but nothing really beats the human element, boots on the ground. And it's also important to know that nothing truly offloads risk. Like you were, you were talking about, Mike, it's not, there, there's no organization, there's no company that's just going to basically uh, do everything. And even if they, even if they were able to, it still doesn't offload the risk, right? The, the risk is still yours as an organization. So the fact of the matter is you need to build out a, a formalized cybersecurity program. It's probably going to take multiple resources to do that. But the first, at least my advice would be the first order of business is to find, if you don't have a good clear understanding of what it takes to do that, find somebody who does. Find an organization or service provider somebody that can, that truly understands how to build a formalized cybersecurity program, not just plug in tools, not just cover bits and pieces or just do the strategy and whatnot, but actually the, the, the spectrum of both strategy and technical, knowing that, okay, your IT people are also going to be involved. You may or may not need additional tools or technologies depending on what, what you have today, but there are additional aspects, even if you get, even if you get both strategic and technical help. So, Hope this hope this supports you in your endeavors and we thank you for listening. Join us next time. Take it easy. We'll see you out there. Take care. Good luck. Happy hunting. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Ants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Ants Podcast. 